The year before, they had made their first playoff appearance ever, and despite their 3-5 and five record, they were playing their second of three Monday night games this year. With the usual Southern hospitality, they hosted the Seattle Seahawks, who not only had never been to the playoffs, but they'd never been in front of a national TV audience on Monday night football either. In just their third year of existence, they are quickly acquainting themselves with the league. Under coach Jack Patera, the Seahawks in 1978 were 9-7, and seven, the most wins for an expansion team in its third year. Their season was disappointing, and like the Falcons, they had won only three games. But if anybody was tuning in for a cool, tranquil matchup, the year's event should have served as an indication of what was to come. Atlanta's Fulton County Stadium may indeed have been bought out by the fans, but only to see two teams that had virtually sold out on the season. As Falcon fans remembered the Civil War days of Stonewall Jackson, their team would have to defend against Seattle receiver Steve Largent, whose hands were anything but stone. Although familiar with defensive coverage, Largent and his teammates took advantage of the media coverage, for it was the team's first Monday night appearance in their four-year history. As expected, Atlanta relied on their rookie running game, number 31, William Andrews, and number 21, Lynn Kane. One, two, and finally a third effort gave Kane a 35-yard touchdown. And with the speed of a falcon hunting its prey, Atlanta led 7-0. Failing to move the ball, Seattle opened the second quarter punting, which quickly turned into pouting. Number 38, cornerback Rick Bias' score put a Falcon team that over the season had been greatly outscored in the first two quarters ahead 14 to nothing. Despite Halloween being just two days away, Seattle coach Jack Patera wasn't putting on any masks. He was mad. And number 10, quarterback Jim Zorn had to prove the Seahawks were present in body as well as spirit. Still searching for an identity, Seattle was a team that ran almost as much as it threw the ball. And number 33, Dan Dornick, was doing most of the legwork. The young Zorn could do some dancing of his own. Every time he carried the ball in 1979, he averaged six yards. But with all these means, Seattle had yet to score on the league's 25th ranked defense until this Seahawk took it on the lamb and zeroed in on the end zone. In 1976, Zorn had been voted AFC Rookie of the Year by his fellow NFL players, although many felt he had not yet lived up to his potential. But in response to any critics, whether running or throwing, Zorn was always thinking. On fourth down and five yards to go, he outwitted a blitzing Falcon defense to make it a 14-7 ball game. Despite the heavy rains, and with Seattle now on the scoreboard, nothing was going to dampen the spirit of Atlanta's fans. Still waving the flag of the Confederacy, Falcon fans had obviously forgotten that during the Civil War, superior Union forces had imposed deadly blockades against the South, shutting them off, much like the Seahawks did to the Falcon backfield. Seattle's defense was led by linebackers Greg Butler and number 58, Terry Beeson. Beeson led the team in tackles with 117, including five against Atlanta. But it didn't matter who made the hit on the rookie Andrews. Every time, everybody took a pounding. Andrews carried 11 times for 50 yards, and for the season, he averaged over four yards a carry. Backfield mate Lynn Kane also took his share of hits. But this was far from the toughest he would suffer. A week later against Tampa Bay, Kane went down for the season with a knee injury and only 63 carries. Seattle sought to tie the score. 
and their first thought was ball control. Dan Dornick had been acquired before the final preseason game and started 12 times for the Seahawks. But as reliable and sturdy as Dornick was, sometimes it was just easier to travel by air. Of course, it always helps when the man in black and white throws the yellow flag on the green grass against the players in red. The pass interference call gave the Seahawks the go-ahead. Even though Coach Patera wasn't dressing in the Halloween spirit, his team was, and they had the best disguise. It'll be the Atlanta 45. Dorn waiting. It's down. They fake it. Dorn back for the pass. He's got a man open. Hurrah! Over the middle of the 20 yard line. He is down at the 18. Herrera's roll reversal was just one switch the Seahawks pulled as number 47, tailback Sherman Smith, blocked for Dorning. Seattle's ability to strike quickly proved why they finished the season ranked fourth in scoring and seventh in total offense. In the first half, they outgained the Falcons by 70 yards, led 21 to 14. The Falcons' Monday night record was four and four, but under head coach Lehman Bannett, the team was undefeated in two previous appearances. For the Falcons, it was back to the running game. In drafting William Andrews, Atlanta was expecting a Cadillac, but they were getting the mileage of a Datsun. Like their foes, Atlanta tried to do things the easy way. The visitors were not very polite as house guests. In 1979, Steve Bartkowski set several team records. Avoiding would-be tacklers was not one of them. He was sacked 54 times all year, and the Seahawks got to him for four of those. The pressure from number 75, Robert Hardy, and his line mates was too much for Bartkowski, and a quick release was no simple solution. This interception was number 22, Dave Brown's gift for starting all 45 games in Seahawk history. Zorn quickly went for the sinuous Steve Largent. The game was one of six in 1979, the Largent caught six passes. But for the first time in four possessions, Seattle was held to a field goal, and their lead was 10. Atlanta again tried to earn their yardage the old-fashioned way, running it. Bartkowski and company, the words of Sir Walter Scott were fitting. The way was long, the wind was cold. Looking for leadership in this comeback march, Bartkowski used seven-year veteran Wallace Francis, who was on his way to a club single-season record 74 catches and more than 1,000 yards. Bartkowski, too, is setting Falcons season records with 2,500 passing yards and 17 touchdowns, including this one to number 82, Billy Reichman. Reichman's playing time had diminished that year with the return of veteran Alfred Jenkins, and he caught just four balls. Two of those were for touchdowns against Seattle, and that pulled the Falcons to within three. Trying to kill the clock, Seattle went with their own version of a time machine. Dornick was having a career night. 21 carries for 122 yards. Although Seattle's strategy for the remainder was no secret, 
Jim Zorn spilled the beans. Entering the game, Seattle had fumbled only seven times in eight games, and now they had lost four in one game. But Atlanta went nowhere quickly. And unfortunately for them, Dornick was doing more than kill the clock. He was killing any chances of an Atlanta win. Dornick's 26-yard touchdown was his second of the night and one of eight rushing touchdowns for the season. In trouble again, Barkowski called on Andrews, Kane, and Reichman. Although easy to be confused with an Atlanta law firm, these three were not prepared for any plea bargaining. Reichman's catch with 51 seconds remaining left some doubt on Dornick's day in court. The Falcons still had some objections. And the man judging gave way, and Atlanta had one last hope. But Dave Brown again had his way with the Falcons and came away with a game-saving second interception. The Seahawks salvaged their second straight 9-7 and seven season and third place in the AFC West. The Falcons finished 6-10, and 10, and though the future would hold some promise, the future would have to wait.